Last time we met, I told you to buy the truth. Proverbs 23, 23 says, buy the truth and do not sell it. Also, wisdom and instruction and understanding. The idea here is, is that the wisdom and truth and understanding of God's word and what he has and what he means for your life is far more valuable than trading those things for the fleeting, um, kind of the fleeting sinfulness of this life. So many people are bending the truth to make that truth fit their own fleshly desires. The Bible says that their God is their own belly. But the problem is, is that goes directly against what God has meant for our lives and what God wanted us to be. He knew that if he were to trade us, if he was to give us the opportunity to choose, right, he wanted us to love him. But true love cannot be forced. True love has to have the opportunity for you to love or to walk away, to choose not to love. He knows that. So he's not going to force you to do anything. But to find yourself on the right side of history, so to speak, in a time when everything is, when prophetic history is moving in a way that we've never seen ever in at any point in time in history. Well, you need to buy that truth and hold on to it so that you will understand the signs of the times. It says in the Old Testament, the sons of Issachar, one of the 12 tribes, those people were so in tune to what was going on. They knew the sign of the times and therefore they were knowledgeable and wise about what to do. And that's who we want to be now because we can read this book and understand it. We want to buy the truth because the truth is narrow. Jesus is the truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. There's no way, there's no way to get to heaven except through him. And that's what we want to talk about today because if we're, if we're not careful, we could get the idea that if we're hiding sin and avoiding the truth, or we have bent over backwards to sell the truth, but we think we have it hidden away somewhere in some special pocket where nobody knows, well, that's a, that's a big mistake because we know that the, the maker and creator of the universe, he already knows. <clears throat> if we look in Hebrews, if we look in Hebrews chapter 4, it, this should be a wake-up call. If you're trying to hide away from your sin, because so many times we're like, well, I can hide it from my spouse. I can hide it from my friends. I can hide it from my boss. I can, I can do that. And I'm living life and I've never been caught and nothing's going on. And therefore, therefore I'm, I'm skating through life and I can, I can have, I can have my debauchery and I can still, I can still look and seem to be clean and holy. That's hypocrisy, by the way. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13, it says, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, God's sight. No, There's no one who can hide from God. He is the all-knowing, omniscient, omnipresent creator of the universe. No one, no creature is hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. How scary is it? It should be. It should grab you by your wits to know that whatever it is you're hiding, whatever it is you're doing, you will have to stand before him and you'll have to have a conversation with him because he already knows about it. Pastor, my pastor today said it really well. He said, anything you think you're hiding here is a scandal in heaven because everyone knows about it. It's already been found out. And the Bible tells us in the Old Testament, be sure to know that your sin will find you out. So if you're hiding it, yeah, maybe you've gotten away with it today. Maybe you've gotten away with it for a couple of months. Maybe you've gotten away with it for a year, but there will be a day and a time when it comes clean and realize sin damages you and it damages others. So today in Proverbs chapter 24, I was reading and it says in 24 verse 21, it says, my son, fear the Lord and the king. Do not associate with those given to change for their calamity will rise suddenly. And who knows the ruin those two can bring. Now, let me unpack this a second because it's really powerful to say. It says, my son, 
fear the Lord and the King. Now, this fear isn't like a haunted house fear. This is a reverent, a reverent fear, a reverent um, uh, kind of understanding of who God is in your life, that he is your creator, that he's running the entire show for you, that he can do anything he wants to in your life, and he can end it just like that if, you, if he decides to. You have to realize you have no power at all in your life. You have the power to choose. And you can choose to go for or be for God. You can learn to fear the Lord and the King, or you can rebel against the Lord and the King, or both. These are people that are in authority. God is in authority. God has put the King, or the President, or the government, or the mayor, or your boss in authority as well. He's saying, you have to have reverence for the Lord and for the King. Now, the King is hard, because we probably losing reverence for what our government is doing, but realize that God has put him there, has put all those people there. And I will tell you that it's probably judgment against our nation for the sins that we have committed. We can see throughout the whole Old Testament that God gave the Israelites over to judgment when well, when they sinned against him, when he was very clear about what the truth was, they didn't buy the truth. They sold it for what they wanted in the area. They wanted another God. They wanted to be like other people. They wanted a king like the other nations. They they fell into prostitution. They fell into all these things. All of it was sinful. And God said, okay, well, you want it, I'll give it to you. And then I'll send leanness on your soul. And then I will hand you over to oppressive leaders and and." really bad leaders. There are other places where they, he gave them over to really bad leadership and really bad decisions led to their downfall. Well, that's what's happening now. Don't think you're going to stop it. You're in the middle of God's prophetic movements. We see that in the book of Revelation, in the book of Daniel. Fear God and fear the king and don't associate with those given to change. Don't associate with the rebels. Don't associate with the people associated with Psalm chapter 2 where he's saying, hey, the kings and the, and the lords and the kings and those in authority are giving over to, to going against or fighting against God and his anointed one, Jesus by saying, let's break our bonds and let's pull ourselves away from the cords of what they're saying. Let's be secular moralists and let's make our own morality and we'll make our own rules and we'll make our own job. We don't need God. Remember what, remember what it says. God will laugh. God will. I don't. I can't imagine. Being so foolish as to believe that I can outsmart God. He's going to laugh. He's laughing now as he brings judgment on our nation. So our nation can't be saved. It's, it's, I don't believe it. God is moving here and he's told us that the time clock's going to tick and tacos is going to go faster and faster and the labor pains are going to get tighter and harder and more intense. He's not going to stop it. It's not going to stop. We are here with wisdom to buy truth and wisdom and instruction and understanding so that we understand the signs of the times. So the question really becomes not, is it near the end? Yes, it is. It, what do we do about it? Because what kind of calamity, what kind of a ruin can these two bring? God and the king. And I hate to tell you this, but they can bring tremendous ruin up into the point of ruining and ending your life. So you're living your life naked and open before the God who knows you're going to need to give account to him for what you're doing. What are you doing with your life? What are you doing with your life now? Because if you're hiding sin and you're not living a life that is that is pleasing to God, if you're not buying truth, but instead you're trading truth so that you can get the fleeting kinds of things that are going on out here with all of these different sinful, this sinfulness stuff, the breaking the bonds and the rules. We talked about definitions. When you destroy the definitions in the Bible, you're selling truth 
for the for the truth of this world. It's a bartering system. You either buy it and do what it takes to get it, or you give it away for what you think is better. But that stuff is fleeting, and it stays here. You can't take it with you when you go. So the question really becomes, what's most important? You need to live a life of holiness. You need to get rid of the sin. You need to repent. Jesus said, look, the kingdom of God is near. Repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. That's how he started his ministry. And now he's come to die for you. And he's died, resurrected. He sits to the right side of heaven. He's your mediator. And he can be your greatest advocate. But you've got to give your life to him. You can't hide away from what you believe you have hidden from God. It doesn't work that way. I want to show you what happens when you hide sin. What sin does to you and other people around you because sin always hurts others. I'll be hanging out today in the book of Joshua, chapter 6 and chapter 7. Now to catch up here, Joshua has taken the reins of Israel. Moses has died, and Joshua has brought them across the Jordan River. God told him in chapter 1 that he was going to be with him, that he was going to deliver everywhere that he stepped was going to be given to him and his people. God had made the decision to destroy the Canaanites who were living, living a tremendously wicked existence. And he told the Israelites, this will be the land flowing with milk and honey. Just go take it. I will be with you. And Joshua, a tremendously intelligent military man with the spirit of God with him, does all the right things up until the chapter 6. He has circumcised the men in accordance with Abraham, the Abrahamic um, covenant of the, of the law, of the circumcision that was given back in Genesis. He has now caught that back up. He's reading in the book he's, because God told him, don't leave the book. I'll be with you if you don't leave the book by wisdom, by truth, and do not sell it. So here he is standing here, and he's standing outside of Jericho. Now, all the, he sent two spies into Jericho, and they found Rahab, and they figured out that this city had tremendous walls and tremendous defenses. But they also found out that these people are fearing the Israelites because of what God was allowing them to do on the other side of the river. This builds a, a tremendous amount of courage and, uh, and, and positive energy in Israel and in the Israelites. And so, so as they're standing outside of Jericho, God gives the instructions on how to take Jericho. For the first six days, walk around it once, and then we'll do that for six days. And on the seventh day, you're going to walk around seven times and then blow a horn and the walls are going to fall down supernaturally. You're not going to do anything and you're going to walk in there and take over the city because God is with you and he can work miraculously. And that's what we see here in chapter six, verse six. It says, Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, proceed and march around the city and let him... Let him who is armed advance before the ark of the Lord. And so it was when Joshua had spoken to the people that the seven priests and the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord advanced and blew the trumpets and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. The armed men went before the priests who blew the trumpets and the rear guard came after the ark while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. And now Joshua had commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I say to you, Shout, and then you shall shout. And so he had the ark of the Lord circle the city, going around it once, and they came into the camp and lodged in the camp. I want you to know something. God has given this tremendously strange number kind of kind of instructions. It didn't make any sense. These are warring people and they've been battling people, sieging cities, destroying kings. They've been doing that all for the last 40 years as they were walking around the wilderness. But God said, don't worry about that crazy city. I'm just going to, I'm going to show you my power. You're going to just walk around a few times. And when you blow the horn on the right time, I'm just going to let the, the, the walls are just going to fall down. I'm going to knock the walls down. 
Now, I want you to pay attention here because if if you were a, a Bible student back in Numbers, we know that when Moses sent the, the 12 spies into the into the wilderness, into Canaan to check it out and look around and see what kind of land it was. Two of those, two of those spies came back and said it was an exceedingly good land and let's go take it because God told us he'd be with us. But 10 of those spies had a bad report and they said, well, all these people are too strong. They're too big. They're too powerful. We couldn't possibly take them. They've forgotten God's promises. Joshua remembering this, by the way, Joshua is one of those two spies who had a good report, who believed that God could help them, that believed that God's promises were just. And that's why he was brought up to be Moses' second in command. But he remembered that when those 10 spies came back and had a bad report, that bad, that discouragement went through the whole camp and it destroyed their courage in God. And because of that, they all voted to go back to the to go back to Egypt. And that's not where you want to be. Don't go back. If you've been saved from yourself, if you've been saved and delivered from your sins, if you have moved on from your drunkenness and from your debauchery and your adultery and your pornography addiction and all of these things, if you've moved on, don't go back. God will be faithful to keep you there. You don't want to go back. Joshua, really smart here, says, don't make a sound and don't talk. Because if these people can't talk, they can't discourage each other as they're kind of methodically walking around the city of Jericho. Because it says here they walked around, they didn't say anything, and they went back to the camp and nothing happened. Verse, 13, verse 12, and Joshua rose early in the morning and the priests took up the ark of the Lord and then seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went on continually blew with the trumpets. And the armed men went before them, but the rear guard came after the ark of the Lord while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. And the second day they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. And so they did this for six days. Now, God comes to you and says, I want you to walk around once and hang out. Tomorrow, I want you to walk around once and I want you to hang out. This happens for a week. Nobody, six days. Nobody sees anything happening. Nobody sees anything happening. Nobody sees anything happening. Joshua is smart to say, don't talk about it so you don't discourage each other. Just be obedient in the mundane stuff that God is telling you to do every day. Because as we learned in Joseph's life and back in Genesis, your life could change in the blink of an eye. You could wake up in jail for the 9,000th day in a row and all of a sudden you you are called by God and you risen up to second in command in Egypt. That's exactly what happened to him. So they're walking around six days, six days, six days. But in verse 15 it says, but it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day, and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. On that day, only they marched around the city seven times. And the seventh time, it happened when the priests blew the trumpets that Joshua said to the people, Shout for the Lord has given you the city. And now the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction, it and all who are in it. Only Rahab the harlot shall live. She and all who are in her house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. Look what it happened. Look at verse 17. Now the city shall be doomed by the Lord. You don't want to be doomed by the Lord. Remember what we were talking about in Proverbs? Fear the Lord and the King. Because you don't know what they what these two can bring upon you. If you're doomed by the Lord... That is a really bad place to be. He is merciful and loving, but he's also just, and he knows what you're hiding. And if you get yourself into this into this continuous form of sin after sin after sin after sin, and you're unrepentant, and you don't turn away from it, and you continue to harden your heart and push him away, he will take it out. You will find yourself doomed by the Lord at some point. If you're listening to this and it has any effect on you, you haven't been there yet, know that you need to repent today. Verse 18, And 
you by all means, by all means, abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. Okay, there's a good instruction. Don't touch the accursed things because if you touch the accursed things, you'll become accursed and you will affect the camp. Now this is an this is a this is an instruction from God. So, if God tells you to do something or to refrain from doing something by truth and do not sell it because God will doom you to destruction and those around you if you're not careful. In this case, look what it says. By all means abstain. That means find a way to force yourself to abstain. Maybe God knew that the things that people would be seeing, the accursed things that were going to be in the city of Jericho, were going to be so... People were going to covet them so much that they were going to sin unless you by all means abstained from taking it. That's where we're talking about. God didn't want them to take things from this city because it's cursed. That, that means it's, 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 it's set off for destruction. It's decrepit. It will ruin you. And what we find out later is, is it's clothing from a pagan nation that's into the demonic. Well, that doesn't help. You bring in demonic things. I, I don't know if you know, but you can bring spiritual oppression into your house by bringing in things that stand for demonic beings. You have to be very careful about the environment in which you live in your house because there is, there is a spiritual side to things that you don't know. And you need to get those things out of the camp. What it, look what it says. And you by all means abstain from the accursed things lest you become accursed and then you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. And so the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpet and it happened. When the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. And then the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city and they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and, and woman and young and old and ox and sheep and donkey and the edge of the sword. By the way, there's archaeological dig sites that show where Jericho most likely was. And there are places where the wall has been laid out flat. God's amazing. God's, God will do amazing things if you just follow his lead. But when we get into Joshua chapter 7, we find out that somebody didn't by all means avoid picking up or touching or taking the accursed things. And this is going to be a tremendous learning point for the entire nation of Israel. Chapter 7 verse 1 says, But the children of Israel committed a trespass. Regarding the accursed things, for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed things. And so the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. Now, interesting that one man sins against God and God's anger comes against the entire nation because sin it does not always, the, the, your sin isn't hidden. It hurts him. It hurts those in heaven. It hurts those who are that great cloud of witnesses we see in, in Hebrews chapter 12, 1 and 2. We know, <laughs> we know that people hurt when you sin, regardless of whether you think anybody knows about it. Pain and discouragement and doom to destruction will come will follow. That's what happens here. People were going to pay the price because one man failed to follow God's rules. Verse 2. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai. 
which is beside beth Aven on the east side of Bethel, and spoke to them, saying, Go up and spy out the country. And so the men went up and spied out Ai, and they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not let all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and attack Ai. Do not weary all the people there, for the people of Ai are few. So about three thousand men went up there from the people, but they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai struck down about thirty-six men. For they chased them from before the gate at far of Sherabim and struck them down on the descent. And therefore the hearts of the people melted and became like water. Joshua makes a mistake here too. Joshua doesn't ask God. He doesn't pray to God for the next, uh, for the next mission to Ai. He's, he, he in his own strength says, Send some people and scout out AI. Not a bad idea, a good tactic. It's good to know your enemy. That's gaining knowledge and wisdom. The problem is, if you're buying knowledge and wisdom and truth and instruction, buy it from the Lord. Don't buy it from your own eyes or from your own heart or what you believe. He fails to pray to God and seek the truth and the understanding needed to take out AI. Instead, he goes and he sends his people. They say, well, it's a little town. It's nothing like Jericho. Don't weary all these people. Just send a couple thousand people. They're going to handle it. No problem. No problem. And what happens? They lose tremendously. 36 Israelite soldiers die. Remember what I said. People die. People get hurt. People are injured and destroyed an account of your sin. Now, everyone will have a chance to get this all figured out, except for those 36 men. They died. Their time is up. And like I said, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to repent and turn away from your sinfulness because things are happening very, very quickly. And how do you know that you'll be alive tomorrow? These men certainly didn't think that they were going to die in battle. They thought that this was a cakewalk. But God didn't allow it to happen. We're going to find out why in a minute. Joshua could have known about it had he prayed, but he didn't. Instead, he took it on upon himself to know and understand what he thought he could do because he had desperately overcommitted himself. Now, here's my question. When you're praying... Do you only pray to God for the big things? Thinking that the little things you don't need God to help you with? Ah, this is a little thing. I don't need God's help. I don't need to pray to God to go down and pay for my groceries. I got it. I got all this. I don't need to bother God who's, who's a really busy guy. Paul tells us to pray without ceasing. And if God is in charge of everything that's happening in your life, every little intricate thing, his, it's what's his, called his providence. He's in control of everything that's happening. Every person who's involved, everything that's going on, he has an intricate key and feeling. If he knows every sparrow that falls from the sky, he's certainly in charge of what's going on in your life. So you need to pray all the time. If Joshua had prayed, even though he thought this was his cakewalk, he might have found out that there was sin in the camp because Achan had taken the accursed things nobody knew about. But because the leader of the Israelite people failed to intercede for his nation, people are going to die. This is how this works. You're interceding for your loved ones and for your family and for your children and for your government. and for It's important don't look past it. So they go in and they and they get handedly defeated by AI. They lose 36 men and now everybody's discouraged. It says, therefore the hearts of the people melted and became like water. And here's here's chapter, here's verse six. Joshua finally comes to his senses and he takes it to the Lord. He takes it late, but he takes it to the Lord, and that's a good start. Because it's never too late to pray. There's just better times than others, right? So verse six says, Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. And he and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all 
to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Oh, that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. Oh, Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns its back before its enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants in the land will hear it and surround us and cut out our name from the earth. And then what will you do for your great nation? This groveling is kind of obnoxious, quite frankly. He's like, well, you told us you were going to be with us, and now you're not with us, and so we should have just stayed where we are, and now what's going to happen? All these Canaanites who are fear you are going to see that, that we failed, and we turn around, and we hightailed, and we ran, and then they're going to come and destroy us, and, and, and what good is that now, God? <laughs> God is so gracious. In, in, our, in, our, in our battles, in our arguments with him, See, if Joshua had just continued the open conversation with God, he may, have, he may have learned these things. This wouldn't have happened. But sometimes God is that drill sergeant who says, quit groveling and get to work. And that's what he says right here. I love God's return after, after this kind of groveling, discouraged sort of prayer by Joshua, wanting to go back. We should go back. No, 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 no. You don't want to go back. God delivered you this far. He's not going to stop. Philippians chapter one tells us that he who has delivered you this far, he who has brought you this far, he who has, who has developed you this far, who's done all the work this far, who's brought you out of your darkness and has, has saved you to lead you to the next thing, he who's brought you to this point will not leave you. He will continue to work on you until the day of our Lord Jesus comes. That's a promise from God. So don't go back. Continue day by day, even if you have to walk around Jericho and just sit down and walk around Jericho and just sit down, walk around Jericho and just sit down. Because day seven, the walls fell and you took the city. He grovels, oh Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns its back before its enemies? He's, the woe is me prayer from Joshua here. Maybe he feels guilty that the 36 men died and that they lost. Maybe he feels guilty he failed. God is gracious. He didn't fail. Just get back, just get back in contact with the Lord. Verse 10, so the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. Get up. Quit talking. Quit, quit groveling. Quit complaining. There's a very specific reason why you lost that war. You lost that battle in Ai is because you've got sin in the camp. But you didn't come to ask me about it. Somebody, somebody did expressly what I told you not to do. For they have... <clears throat> for they have even taken some of the accursed things and have both stolen and deceived. And they have also put it among their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turn their backs before their enemies because they have become doomed to destruction. There's that doomed to destruction again. Somebody comes in, he steals the accursed things, and then, he, and then he deceives people by saying nothing had happened, and then he hides it. We're going to find that out here in a minute, what Achan did. <laughs> and what happens? The doom to destruction occurs, and the people of Israel fail. So he goes through, in the rest of this chapter, he goes through you, to, to work on getting finding out who it was that sinned. Now, we know that Achan sinned because the Bible tells us in retrospect at the beginning of chapter 7 that Achan was the one who did that. But at this point, nobody knows he's completely hidden it. <clears throat> so we get down to verse 16. It says, So Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought the clan of Judah, and he took the family of the Zerahites, and he brought the family of the Zerahites man by man, and Zabdi was taken. And then he brought his household but man by man, and Achan, the son of Kermai, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, the tribe of Judah, was taken. And now Joshua said to Achan, my son, I beg you, give glory to the Lord of God of Israel and make confession to him. And tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. 
And Achan answered the Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I have done. When I saw... When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and I took them. And there they are hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with the silver under it. And so Joshua sent the messengers and they ran to the tent and there it was hidden in his tent with the silver under it. And they took them from the midst of the tent brought them to Joshua and all the children of Israel and laid them out before the Lord. And then Joshua and all of Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the garment, the wedge of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that he had. And they brought them to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. And so all of Israel stoned him with stones and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones, still there to this day. And so the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger, and therefore the name of that place has become the Valley of Acre to this day. And chapter 8, verse 1 says, Now the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. Take all the people of the war with you, and arise and go up to Ai. See, I have given it to you in the hand. And the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. And you shall do to Ai and the king as you did to Jericho and his king. Only its spoil and its cattle you shall take as booty for yourselves. Lay an ambush for the city behind it. What a dreadful end. Achan sins. He doesn't come clean right away. When things start to happen, he hides it. He takes the accursed things he's not supposed to take, idolatry. He trades the knowledge of God. God told him, don't do it. He trades the truth of God by selling it for the, for the fleeting pass of the things that he covets. Thou shalt not covet in the, in the Ten Commandments, a sin. He hides it. He does confess. And what happens is entire family and all his livestock and everything he owns are killed and burned and buried. His entire family pays the price for Achan's sin. Now, luckily, God doesn't work that way. He sent his son to die for us, and we have opportunities to be saved, to repent and turn away from our habitual sins and the deception and the hypocrisy that we carry in our own hearts. We don't think he can see it, but we know he can see it. This is a perfect example of that. Joshua had no idea. They lose this AI battle. They think that God had turned his back, and he did because he stopped, because he knew Achan had sinned, and he knew that it needed to be cleansed, and he knew that he needed to get the sin out of the camp so that the camp could be cleansed and they could be ready for God's help again because God can't help the sitting of the people. Now, this is really, really important to realize because it's not much different than it is today. You can't be a habitual sinner failing to repent and turn away from your sins, failing to, to, to apologize to God. What that means is, is you're stomping all over the blood of Jesus who, who died for you. You, you, can't, you can't accept a prayer and then go off and live your life in habitual rebellious sin. Don't give in to the change. You need to change and re you need to repent. <clears throat> This part in Hebrews here, I think, is really interesting. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7 says, Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outside of their conduct. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried, carried about with various and strange doctrines. Don't turn away to things you haven't heard about. Real Buy the truth and don't sell it. You know what Jesus did for you. You know the gospel of Christ. You know you need to repent of your sins. You know you need to come clean. You know you have an advocate in heaven. You can come to the throne room and tell him you're sorry and stop it. Stop it. Don't be carried away by strange doctrines. For it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. And it's talking about the sin, the, the back in back in 
In Leviticus, you learn about the sin offering. You could bring in, if you've sinned, you can bring in an animal and the, and the priest would kill the animal, sprinkle the blood all over the altar, but the animal could not be eaten because it's sinful. So you had to take the sin out of the camp, out of the tabernacle, out of the city and burn it outside the city. Because it was tainted with sin. What that would do is, is you'd bring this animal, they would kill the animal, the animal would take your sin, he would take the punishment for your sin, and then you would get it out of the city. You had to get it out of the town. You got to get it out of the camp because it's sinful. Now that is just a picture because listen to what he says next. This is for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no we don't have a continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. <laughs> Jesus bled inside the city for your sins. And because he who knew no sin became sin, so he was sinful, became the righteousness of God, the transaction that your sins were forgiven and he took the sins upon himself. He, was, he needed to be taken outside the camp to die. He did that for us. He took the sin out of the camp and he went out there with the unclean because that's why he came. Now it says here that we need to go out there with him and bear the reproach, bear the suffering that Christ suffered to die to ourselves, not to sell the what he's given us. We need to buy the truth and not sell it because selling it turns away to whatever it is you want out here and that doesn't help. You need to die to yourself. You need to become you need to become like Christ. Give away all this stuff in this life, this fleeting stuff, and be ready for a city that is not here. The city is up there with him, hidden in Christ. It says in Abraham, Hebrew says that, that Abraham and his, and his family, they were waiting for a city whose hands were made, whose, whose maker was God. The city of Jerusalem in heaven. Jesus said, look, my, my followers are not of this kingdom. My kingdom is in another place. If it were so, they would be fighting for me if it was here, but it's not. But you can only partake of that if you live your life correctly. And what does that look like? Well, Second Peter, Second Peter chapter three, verse 10 says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. That means you don't know when it's coming. You don't know when that day is. You're playing or you're betting on the time that you think you've got all of this figured out. You don't. So <laughs> live your life in this manner as if today was the last day you had the opportunity to do it. And watch around, walk around Jericho and walk around Jericho and walk around Jericho every day, living a holy life, buying truth, not selling it, and standing under the standing under the truth of God's word and living a holy life. It says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, and in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we according to his promise look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. 
He's saying all of this stuff. You don't know the day he's coming back. You don't know the time he's coming back. And when he does, all this stuff that's around you, all this stuff you've got going on, the house you're living in, the stuff that you have, the money you've got, all of this stuff will burn with fervent heat and you will not have it anymore. Is it worth it? What kind of guy do you need to be? What kind of a woman do you need to live so that you'd be ready to go on to the new heavens and new earth, which of which where righteousness dwells. What kind of person should we be in holiness in these last days, knowing that God's prophetic truth is rolling on very specifically right now? We've talked about one world orders and one world religions and one world single economics and, and, and the horsemen and the prophecies and all this stuff we've been talking about for all this time. You, you need to see, like the sons of Issachar, you need to be aware of the signs of the times. Well, I'll finish with uh, Peter in his first letter. <clears throat> Chapter 4, verse 7, it says, But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability of which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, friends, I cannot implore you enough. You need to deal with the sins that you think you're hiding away Come clean, repent of them before God. If there are victims involved in it, you need to come clean and deal with the consequences that you would not, that your, uh, that your conscience would not be seared with a hot iron. Because the minute the, it gets to the point where there is no turning back, your morality is gone. Oh, the dangers. Remember what he said. Remember what we said in Proverbs chapter 25, what I read you, what I read to you at the very beginning of all of this. My son, fear the Lord and the King. Do not associate with those given to change. Do not, do not associate with rebels, those who stand against God's word. Don't associate with them. For their calamity, those who the rebels calam the, the calamity will fall on those rebels suddenly. You don't know the day or the hour in which your life will end. Oh, and the ruin that can come from the Lord and from the King. And really, if you want to make the point, it's from the Lord because whatever the King does is at the hands of the Lord. The Lord will bring ruin to you really quickly when He's done waiting. He's been patient up until this point. Peter talked about people who were who, the mockers who said, where, where is the promise of his coming? I'm telling you, it's coming. God told us the end from the beginning so that we would understand. Buy truth and don't sell it. And, and take care of this stuff because your sins that you think you're hiding are open and naked and honest before the God of the creation, the one who you have to give account to, and people are going to pay for it. You need to come clean and repent and turn to God. Die to yourself, pick up your cross, crucify your life, and follow him so that you would be hidden in Christ in heaven and for the times that are yet to come. Happy Sunday and be blessed.